afternoon. My name is Britt Kremeyer. I'm originally born and raised from Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm a We the People alum. I'm currently, a, I'm currently an attorney in Boise, Idaho, but I'm actually quarantining in Georgia. So I'm just below you guys. So it's nice to have some fellow East Coasters with me today. Yes, ma'am. And yes, I am Colby. I'm an attorney from Denver, Colorado. I'm Gus Chin. I'm a municipal judge for the cities of Holiday and Cottonwood Heights in the state of Utah. Will you please take a moment to introduce yourselves? Um, hi, I am Dylan Prince. I'm Hannah Ferguson. And I'm Patrick Priori. Wonderful. We're so glad to be with all of you today. We are Unit 5, and we're going to dive right into question number two. Richard Posner wrote that the American public worries more about invasions of privacy than about summary proceedings against suspected terrorists, curtailments of the freedom of speech of the law abiding, or the right of the media to publish government secrets. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? Why or why not? To what extent, if any, is privacy in jeopardy today? What protection, if any, do people, from, do people have from privacy violations by governments or businesses? You may begin. This statement is correct. According to Professor Timothy Baranow, Americans are not consumed with the thought of terrorism because it rarely occurs where one's privacy could be violated on a daily basis. According to Pew Research, 81% of, of Americans think the potential risks of data collection by companies about them outweigh the benefits, and 66% say that the same about government data collection about them. People have interpreted that privacy could have been mentioned in the 14th Amendment in the Due Process Clause after the cases of Roe v. Wade in 1972, Einstein v. Bard in 1971, and Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965. The 14th Amendment Due Process Clause states, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within jurisdiction of the equal protection of the laws. Griswold v. Connecticut was the first privacy case where the Supreme Court ruled that the states can't make the use of contraceptives of married couples illegal. Opposite of Griswold v. Connecticut, Massachusetts was having a different problem. In the case of Eisenstadt v. Baird, Massachusetts law ruled that only married couples can, ob can obtain birth control. Excuse me. The Supreme Court weighed in on this matter, and Justice William J. Brennan Jr. said, it is the right of the individual, married or single, to be free from unwarranted governmental intrusion into matters so fundamentally affecting a person as the decision whether to bear or beget a child. In the more well-known cases of Roe v. Wade, Jane Roe declared that her first, fourth, ninth, and 14th Amendment rights were being restricted by a law in Texas that made abortions illegal, unless it was vital to save the woman's life. Even with these advancements, privacy is still in jeopardy today. Indubitably, the need for protection from the government over privacy inherently implies a threat against that very right. However, privacy is a special case. From the dawn of the Constitution, privacy has not been included whether for the tides of the public of the time or for the discretion of the government's actions. Subsequent to Alexander Hamilton's argument in Federalist Number 85, the very implementation of the Bill of Rights has created a disparity. Although beyond Hamilton's original description of consequences, privacy has become a victim of the implementation of the Bill of Rights due to the fact that the inclusion of it without that of the acknowledgement of privacy has given the government free reign over what is and what is not included in the complementary and secondary document to our Constitution. Up until Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965, the very definition of privacy was lacking other than a slight interpretation of the, in the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause of 1868. This is similar to that of the British government's informal constitution for its citizens. On that basis, this right is not articulated in the constitution, leaving it up to further court decisions to either strengthen or jeopardize the right. The threat lies in the very future of the United States judicial actions. It depends on how the court deals with the next issue in which the right of privacy may be malleable, such as within technological circumstances. In the United States beyond precedent, the fourth, fifth, and 14th Amendments help to protect citizens' privacy from the government. However, there are no federal standards for cyber protection. Carpenter v. U.S. Are, gives some precedent to help protect digital privacy, but state rulings, such as in the matter of the search of a residence in Oakland, California, judges are rolling back the privacy in the digital age. 
As Judge Candace Westmore stated, technology is outpacing the modern law. Wonderful, we have some follow-up questions for you. So one of the questions I have for you is that you mentioned that technology uh, is outpacing the laws. So what kind of modifications would you suggest be put into place in order to protect our privacy and to keep up with technology as it advances? Well, the, the, uh, the, that... the European oh, sorry, Union, yeah. um, the European Union actually has a uh, regulation put in place called the General Data Protection Regulation. Of, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's code seven, uh, 679 of May 2016, in which they implicate a much more strict data protection um, standards than the United States. The United States relatively does not have the, the uh, data protection standards that the U European Union has. This, this law allow, um, enforces them to have to put in place data protection officers and companies that are systematically collecting data. Um, they have to face fines if they don't, if they don't actually um, uh, disclose the data collection or if there's a breach within the, within the, uh, the data collection system. Um, so there is much more stringent, uh, stringent regulations within the European Union. And this can go back to Mad Madison versus Jefferson, in which Jefferson actually um, in for was backing an amendment that uh, would block monopolies. Uh, and, and Madison was actually very much against this because he was actually more focused on the government overreach and not necessarily from corporations. So there's always been a lack of uh, regulation on corporate power within the United States. Um, but this one just happens to be predicated far beyond um, what many people actually see. It's, 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 a, it's a rooted problem within since the anti-federalist versus the federalist argument. A solution to this uh, problem nowadays would be if we were to inscribe an amendment into our constitution that specifically dealt with privacy with technology. Um, in a case in 2016, a local case in California was actually one that Judge Candace Westmore ruled on. And in this case, a man's um, fingerprint was allowed to, to um, be taken away from him to enter his iPhone because it was just considered circumstantial evidence and a key to a lockbox rather than the code to a wall safe. And this also, and Pat gave the world example, and this is something that we should follow. I believe that we should. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I want to be able to have my co-judges ask questions. I'm going to turn the time to Les. All right. <clears throat> what can we as individuals do in terms of trying to prevent the invasion of our privacy, including do we have access to encryption devices which would protect our our use of the internet? Do we have <clears throat> to proceed to court to challenge the companies that collect this information or to challenge our government? Do we have individual remedies for the problem you've described? Um, most definitely. I think uh, what a lot of people overlook is the power of the vote. Uh, it's, it's a simple solution. Uh, we vote in a uh, reputable, it, it goes back to Federalist number 10 by uh, James Madison himself in large republics. We, this, this republic works on the power of the people, the power of the vote. We vote in uh, representatives of ourselves that are reputable. We should trust them because that's our vote. So we have to value the power of the vote over anything else. And that's our, that's our most vital tool within a democratic system. Let me then chime in if I may. Sorry. Uh, okay. Given the fact that there is such a concern about personal privacy, if national security and the common good are at issue, then should, not, should we not be willing to sacrifice some of that privacy for security and the common good? I believe we should be able to sacrifice some of that privacy because we are saving lives. For example, during the coronavirus right now, the people who do have the coronavirus should be released to people such as the police in their area so they can continue to keep other people safe and make sure those people aren't going out into the world and, and um, getting other people sick so we don't keep the spread of the coronavirus going. Benjamin um, Franklin I'm going once to said- disagree. Go ahead, Dylan. I'm gonna disagree with Hannah and not as much on a governmental perspective, but a medical perspective. Right. And in the hospital system and in the healthcare system, there is something called HIPAA, which is a patient protection agency. And in order to protect our patients, we cannot discuss what conditions they might have or what they might possess because this could tarnish their personal reputation and their communities. And it violates the very basic uh, right of privacy. And there's four levels of violation within HIPAA. And if someone's um, condition were to be revealed of what they had in their name and their location, 
then this goes straight from a level one to a level four violation, which could cause our doctors and nurses to lose their practice or their license as a whole. Benjamin Franklin once said, those who give up essential liberty for temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. It is very fundamental in these times that we have to be st steadfast in our rights. We have to remember that these are the times where our rights can be challenged. And if they're not, if, if they're not steady in times of crisis, how can they be steady in times of peace? How do you find the balance, though, between privacy and protecting the common good? Um, so in the, within the Fourth Amendment, there is actually multiple ways to get around a warrant. I mean, so we can actually apply that process here. Uh, one of the warrant ways to get around a warrant is public safety or, or risk of destruction of evidence. So that has been uh, being engaged on a daily basis, no matter what. Um, if someone is suspected of a terrorist act and it's, and it's almost imminent, imminent lawless action, uh, to even cite other uh, free speech uh, cases, so, uh, such as the lemon test, uh, you, you have to, you, there, that is being engaged on a daily basis. So public safety is not necessarily a topic that is not, not being debated. It, it, it is within the warrant process. And so therefore, I think that engaging uh, pub, public safety, if it is in, within imminent violent action upon it, or it's, it's going to harm a citizen, most definitely, yeah, sure, we should be able to uh, give up some rights. But, but we have to be very careful with what we give up and what we do not give up. As my colleague Dylan was saying earlier, there needs to be an amendment to the Constitution and it needs to include what rights we have as privacy and what we don't have. Please finish your thought. Um, as I was saying, we talked to the Coast Guard representative named Vince and he said that there is no privacy when he wants to search a boat. He can easily just go on a boat and say that he's looking for life jackets if he suspects something such as cocaine on board or the driver has been drinking over the limit and he can just go on. There's no privacy for the Coast Guard inspecting boats. So to set these privacy standards in, in the book and to have it set down, just like anything else, it should be an amendment and we should hold a constitutional convention to be able to put this amendment in place. Thank you. Let's give you guys a round of applause. Thank you. Thank We're you. We're just gonna take a few moments to give you guys some feedback. First of all, I just want to congratulate all of you for making it to the finals and having to do it in such an unorthodox fashion. We know that this is uncomfortable. If you think it's uncomfortable for you guys who are so hip with technology, imagine how it is for some of us trying to toggle back and forth. And it is very uncomfortable. We're sorry for having to interrupt you, but it's take it as a compliment when your judges have such great questions that we want to ask you because it means that you, your opening presentation uh, got our minds just spinning and we want to just pick your brains even more. So when you have a hot panel of judges, that's a good thing. When there's crickets, that's when you need to be concerned. But when your judges want to jump in and they just want to just go at it, it, it is always a, a compliment to how your prepared statement, uh, how we perceived your prepared statement. I know that this has been a challenging year for all of you. Thank you so much. Again, we have enjoyed getting to hear your thoughts. We can tell that this is a diverse panel. I like that you guys disagreed and not just to disagree. It's a, there's obviously a sincere level of uh, disagreement, which is good. I think that this is part of this program is teaching civics and teaching young, young people, how do we tackle these issues when we don't agree? How do we find the common ground and take these unique perspectives and put them together? So thank you again. And I, I turn the time over to my fellow judges. Again, congratulations for your hard work. I was particularly impressed with your knowledge of our history, uh, citing the Madison-Hamilton debates, uh, citing the um, Federalist Paper 85, Ben Franklin. I thought that those references clearly establish our history of regard to privacy. Certainly the abuses of the British um, and you mentioned that too, British abuses during the colonial period sparked the idea that we deserve privacy or as Brandeis once said, the right to be let alone. And I, I think you have focused on that. We haven't ever had as big a threat to privacy as we currently have. And as I've told past teams, this is a problem for your generation to solve. And you've proposed a couple of things that I think are very, very interesting. One is a new amendment to address this problem. I will tell you that's very difficult because even if you get two thirds of the 
uh, House to agree, it still has to be adopted by 36 of the states. The problem we have is 11,591 amendments have been proposed. 34 have been submitted to the states, of which 27 have been adopted, and that includes the Bill of Rights. So that is a rather remote possibility. But you also brought up another one about the power of vote. If we hold our elected representatives to a standard of you must protect our privacy, I think we will have more success than if we propose an amendment. It could well be that the people would enjoy an amendment, but more than likely, um, we will have to rely upon the vote. We also have a problem with the vote in the sense that the companies that we're talking about regulating are heavy contributors to political campaigns. And therefore, the ability of the candidates to be elected and to oppose their supporters is somewhat limited. But I do like the history. You brought up the Coast Guard. We could have talked about warrants at the border, which are not required uh, to search people who are trying to enter the United States. Uh, but you brought up for the first time the 14th Amendment. And it's a difference between privileges and immunities for citizens and all rights for people, not necessarily citizens. And I think your, your knowledge in that regard was very, very impressive. I thank you for your hard work, and I thank your teacher for the hard work that obviously your teacher has done. Thank, thank you. you. I join my colleagues in yes. commending you on your preparation, your participation in the program, and the reasoning. I would love to have a cottage side meeting with uh, three of you to discuss this notion of a constitutional amendment in very as various aspects of the law. Very intrigued by the, the responses you provided. It surely demonstrates that you are certainly committed to safeguarding one of these important issues. And hopefully, with individual responsibility, you'll be the ones to bring about, maybe, who knows, that amendment. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.